we live in a society which is characterized by addictive behaviors all kinds of things we're controlled by all kinds of stuff we're greedy people we're driven by our thoughts and instincts our desires uh, alcohol and drugs are just very common commonplace terms but there are many many other ways in which we can be addicted and if you were to visit a therapist and they said you were addicted to sex i'm pretty sure your first recourse will be a kind of defense mechanism saying oh, no what what are you talking about to deny and that's typical of addiction to deny deny the problem even to yourself that, that you might need help and in church circles where i'm working that's you know like, we don't want to talk about it it's easier to just not talk about such things or to say that they don't exist but in our society this is all too common and not every person who has some difficulty or problem involving sex or sexual relationship is addicted but it's a progressive thing it's a progressive difficulty and if you think about sexual addiction in the same way that you might think about other addictions then the parallel helps us understand if, if we say that alcoholism means that you have a dependence upon this substance or drugs you have a pathological relationship with a mood altering chemical well it's the same with a sexual addiction with an unhealthy relationship that you're tied into something and the addict substitutes a sick relationship for the to an event or a process for a healthy relationship with others and it gets worse and of course this is common in all kinds of addiction that you have an inner life and an outer life and one of them can be the the way that you present to the world and the one of the other is the way that you are in yourself in, in inside and it's uh, becomes a fog and it becomes a polarity it becomes a hypocrisy of course and in the bible there's a interesting description of this progressive nature of addiction in james chapter 1 verse 14 16 each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed then when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death do not be deceived my beloved brethren don't lose track of where you should be now don't be put off by the word sin here i know people sort of say oh, i don't believe in sin but the, the word the greek word which is translated sin is it means falling short of a mark and so the idea is that you are not where you could be you are not where you could be and that's i find that really helpful when when it's speaking to people if they if they want to be anti-church I, I can quite often agree with them <laughs> but, but most people accept they are not where they should or could be there, there's an issue so that's the that's the thing and there's a kind of a cycle that's that's demonstrated in in this passage a, a preoccupation with something developing into a compulsion leaving you in despair leaving you in a sort of swamp where you can't get out of it what i'm describing here is is addictive behavior okay and the end result is very disappointing very painful very isolating so why would you repeat it well there's something there's something in it the, the pain that you feel the despair that you feel at the end of the cycle can only be eased by going back to the beginning of it and so you get caught into a addiction cycle and you become hostage to your own preoccupations and jesus gave a very concise perspective about the enslaving potential of all kinds of sin falling short of human 
potential. He said, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Wow. What do you think of that? Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And that which you tolerate will one day dominate. If you allow certain behavior, it will progress. And we live in a society that promotes freedom of speech, freedom of action, and I do as I please. It doesn't hurt you, or if it only hurts you a bit, <laughs> but my self, my ego, my desires are paramount, okay? And we discard any inhibitions, any sexual hang-ups, and, and suspicion attracts Submission is, is attached to anyone who wants to go the other way. Well, I say, well, I want to live a celibate life. And say, oh. <laughs> okay. Now, God has designed human sexuality to be a blessing. And he revealed his intent right at the beginning of the Bible, that, that passage in Genesis 2, 24. A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. They will become one flesh. And that is a a beautiful and dignified picture of marriage, commitment, partnership as an intimate relationship. And that understanding is confirmed in the New Testament by Paul in 1 Corinthians, he calls sexual intercourse becoming one flesh, 1 Corinthians 6. And so he's saying, so when he says flee sexual immorality, he's saying, saying, this is the model, everything else is not the model. This is going to lead you astray, okay? And there are whole passages in the New Testament with the same, with the same intent. Okay, so what, what do we do? What do we do? We're, we're bound into the middle of a war zone. If you think about, put, put other forms of addiction to one side and just think about this. I used to live in, in, in London, near the where the m4 comes in and they put a, a giant poster of a scantily clad woman on the on the side of the m4 and they had a series of crashes <laughs> because they had to move it because uh, men were driving down the road and looking at this poster and then then driving off the the motorway okay All right and it's a wonderful parallel parable of how you can be distracted from your course by what is a natural normal desire but it's being fed in an unhelpful and unhealthy way and it takes you of course paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the obedient, into captivity, into the obedience of Christ. And that is maybe that sounds complicated, but the intent is really simple. It's like saying, saying your brain is, is, is in the middle of a war zone. Let's bring it together let's bring it together to break the hold of sexual addiction is very difficult all forms of addiction are, are vicious and and the probably the best way of thinking about it is the the old aa program alcoholics anonymous when they say you have to begin by confession you have to begin by acknowledging that there's a problem here you have to begin with saying, my name is Ken, I am an, an alcoholic. You know, my name is, okay, are you, are you with me? And you need other people. We need to be in a caring, loving community where we're going to love and trust and receive from one another. So we're in this circle together it's, and we have to live a program. And once that begins, then you have left your double life. You've, you've come out of your isolation saying, I I just have to tell you this. I've got a problem. I've got a problem. Okay, well, I'm just going to finish here with two, two stories. Two stories from the life of, of Jesus. They come to mind, and they both relate loosely to sexual sin. 
and they're in in women and i'm not being biased here or saying <laughs> saying anything they're just the two that, that that have come to mind now and all the quotes that i've made so far relate to both genders equally and of course addiction is no respecter of gender but just right now i want to finish with the way that jesus dealt with people who were caught in sexual sin. It surprised me. One is the, in 1 John, in John 4, Jesus encounters this Samaritan woman. So she's not Jewish, she's like half Jewish. She's a foreigner. So he has, a, he has to overcome a boundary to even speak to her. She's an, a foreigner, an outsider. And his disciples are surprised that she's speak, he's speaking to a woman. A, a foreign woman, somebody who's not Jewish. They were being very prissy about it, but there's something else. I think there's the undertone of them saying a woman, a foreign woman, and that sort of woman. So Jesus, as the conversation goes on, he says, you've had five husbands. The man you're with now is not your husband. So she has had a series of relationships. She's frustrated, isolated, bound in an unhealthy relationship, and she seeks to brush him off, and he speaks with, with spiritual insight into where she is, and she's surprised by his insight, by his knowledge of where she is, and starts to listen. But here's the point. It's a very, very simple point. He asks nothing of her except one thing. He gives her no response to her past life, to the difficulties and problems that she's faced, except one thing. He just asks one question. Are you thirsty? Do you want a drink? Are you thirsty? It's such an unusual and captivating question. He's offering her the opportunity to not be bound by her past, but to explore the possibilities of the present. I find that wonderful. So I'm just saying, wherever you are and whatever your past, I believe Jesus just says one thing into this specific kind of addiction. He says, okay, okay, the, the, sure, sure, sure. But, but listen, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Do you, want, do you want what I have to give you? That really blesses me. Are you sick of the way you second story is in John chapter 8 and Jesus is confronted by a lynch mob carrying a woman caught in the very act of adultery you know that story and it's all a scam it's all designed to just catch Jesus out and to come against his popularity with the crowd and she has you know she's been exposed she's been humiliated you might say well, where's the man it's like, yeah sure that's right it's, it, this is not justice this is a lynch mob but he's equal to it and once again, he, he deals with this woman in her situation, where she is. He deals with healing, with tenderness, with courtesy, and with a way out. This is what's so wonderful about Jesus. This is how he deals with us too. He, he says, let those who are without sin cast the first stone. You know, you know the story. He, he confronts the crowd with their hypocrisy. He confronts the, the whole situation, not in terms of justice, it has to be done, but in terms of mercy, mercy. The way that you deal with someone else is the way that God is gonna deal with you. Are you really prepared to cast stones? What about your own situation? Where are you exactly? Hey, let those who are without sin cast it. So no one can. He's the only one there who could. And then he turns to the woman and he says, where are your accusers? I find that wonderful. Where are your accusers? Is there no one left to accuse you? And they said, no, they've gone. Said, oh, okay, I don't condemn you go and sin no more. So in that last sentence, he acknowledges her situation. He acknowledges the problem, but he offers a way out. 
So I believe these two stories help us to understand how Jesus deals with people caught in sexual addiction. He doesn't go easy on the problem, but he offers a way out and he does it with healing, with tenderness, with courtesy and the opportunity of grace. Amen. May the Lord bless you as we reflect on these things.